Good morning, everybody. Molly, many thanks for welcoming me, welcoming me today. Everybody, a uh, warm welcome. My name is Dr. Vidya Prakash. I am an infectious diseases physician at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine, where I also serve as chief medical officer for the academic clinical practice. So I serve as chief medical officer and associate dean of clinical affairs and population health. And I also have the tremendous honor of serving as president of the SIU Medicine Chapter, Infectious Diseases Chapter for Health for the World. Um, so many, many thanks to Health for the World leadership, to Molly, and to all of you for having me today. I'm going to be talking to you about diabetic foot infections for our Health for the World Grand Rounds. So let's start with how we even define diabetic foot infection. Very simply, a diabetic foot infection is any infection involving injury to any or all of the layers of the skin in a patient with diabetes. So it can be a skin and soft tissue infection going down to deeper structures, like the muscles, the bone, the joint. Um, it's really an all-encompassing term for infections of the skin in patients with diabetes. So let's look at the lifetime risk for a diabetic patient of developing a diabetic foot ulcer. It's between 19 and 34 percent, so fairly substantial. And when you take a step back and you look globally, between nine and 26 million people develop a diabetic foot infection or foot ulcer every single year. And of those, up to 60% develop infection. So up to 60% of diabetic foot ulcers turn into diabetic foot infections. And 20% of severe diabetic foot infections result in amputations, unfortunately. When you look at osteomyelitis, bone infection, specifically diagnosed by culture, the incidence is about 20% of diabetic foot ulcers. So the goal is, since we see that a substantial portion of patients will develop a diabetic foot ulcer, if it comes to that, we want to prevent those from getting infected, but we also want to even take a step back and make sure that they don't develop the foot ulcer in the first place. And we will talk about preventive measures uh, towards the end of this lecture. Now, what about hospitalized patients? What are the stats for hospitalized patients with diabetic foot infections specifically? The majority of patients will have some element of peripheral neuropathy, whether it's motor, sensory or autonomic, they're going to have some element of neuropathy, which is what put them at risk for the diabetic foot ulcer and ultimately infection in the first place. More than 50% have evidence of peripheral artery disease, and nearly 50% have infection that's advanced to the bone, which is defined as a moderate diabetic foot infection. 40% have a history of a diabetic foot infection in the year prior to hospitalization, so this is not something new to them. And when you look at where the infection is, it's usually in the weight-bearing areas. So 45% involve the toes and 34% involve the forefoot. When these patients are hospitalized for their diabetic foot infection, the median duration of hospitalization is around three weeks. And during that period, 35% undergo some form of lower extremity amputation. And within a year of discharge, 19% will have amputation and 21% will have persistent or recurrent infection. And I will say that this data came from a study of 291 patients hospitalized with diabetic foot infection at 38 hospitals. So a pretty robust data set, and it really paints the picture of what these, in, what these patients have in store once they have an infection that's serious enough to be admitted to the hospital. So let's look at risk factors for diabetic foot ulcers. I already talked about how, especially if they're going to be admitted to the hospital with an infection, 
the vast majority of them have some form of peripheral neuropathy, which is a huge risk factor for developing the ulcer in the first place. So sensory, motor, or autonomic. Another huge risk factor is foot deformity that comes as a result of motor neuropathy. Any form of trauma, any prior foot ulceration, and as I said, peripheral artery disease are risk factors. So if you look at this schematic here on the right, the motor neuropathies, it affects muscles in the legs leading to protrusion of abnormal bones. That changes the architecture of the foot leading to deformities such as hammer toe um, and hallux rigidus, which is stiffening of the great toe to the point that they can't move it anymore. Well, then that further lends itself to biomechanical abnormalities and ultimately callus formation, which you see in this graphic. How about sensory neuropathy? Um, you know, I, I have heard this quote where patients have lost the gift of pain. In this case, in this case, in these cases for diabetic patients in particular, pain is something they want to have. When they lose the protective sensation, they have no idea that they've developed a callus or an ulcer until it's too late, until it's gotten to the point that's a, that it's infected. With an autonomic neuropathy, you have dry skin, which triggers fissures and skin crusts. And again, that makes the foot very vulnerable to minimal trauma. So now you have a callus, either due to motor, sensory, or autonomic neuropathy. You have the callus formation. And now what? Repetitive external or even minor trauma, because it happens over and over again, leads to subcutaneous hemorrhage and ultimately a foot ulcer. And remember, factors such as peripheral, peripheral artery disease case in this process. And so this is really the chain of events that ultimately leads to a foot ulcer, which again is extremely vulnerable to infection. What about diabetes in particular makes this such a good milieu for infection in particular? So things like sustained hyperglycemia, the pro-inflammatory environment that being a diabetic and a hyperglycemia facilitates, and the combination of peripheral artery disease and peripheral neuropathy causes several things. First of all, it alters immune function. It affects the inflammatory response. It causes endothelial cell dysfunction and it impairs neovascularization and that ultimately leads to abnormal wound healing. So let's take a closer look at this. Let's look at what's going on in, so you've got the top layer, the epidermis, and then you have the dermal layer. What's going on with the extracellular matrix of the dermal layer in a diabetic that makes it so prone to lack of wound healing and ultimately the development and an ulcer and ultimately infection? So first of all, when you're in a hyperglycemic state, you have an increase in what we call AGEs or advanced glycation end products. And that in turn, when you see uh, in, an increase in AGEs in the extracellular matrix, it increases the stiffness of the extracellular matrix. It also reduces the elasticity of the extracellular matrix. And that leads to disruptions in the cell to extracellular matrix interactions, aberrant signaling. Now, how about production of the extracellular matrix? So if you have reduced collagen, you're going to reduce skin thickness. And then decreased elastin, as its name sounds, reduces elasticity. And then when you look at the general you know, production and degradation of fibronectin in the extracellular matrix, in a diabetic, dysregulation of that process contributes to poor wound healing. Now, what are these odd terms here? TSP1, TSP2, ANGPTL4. So these are matricellular proteins, TSP1 being very important in wound healing. But you see that in a diabetic patient, that TSP1 protein is reduced and then TSP2 is increased, and that combination delays wound healing. 
ANGPTL4, that's another matricellular protein, that is supposed to have positive effects on keratinocyte migration and angiogenesis. And when these levels are reduced, again, it impairs wound healing. Osteoponin. So osteoponin is a glycoprotein associated with bone hemiostasis. And when that's increased in secretion um, to a certain level, then it increases the inflammatory response and chronic inflammation in the wound. HA stands for hyaluronin, and that maintains tissue hydration and elastoviscosity. And you see that that's reduced in a diabetic patient. And what are GAGs? GAGs, um, including dermatin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, and heparin sulfate, form proteoglycans and promote wound healing. And then finally, you have the extracellular matrix enzymes, MMPs, which are matrix metalloproteinases that degrade hot collagen and result in a highly proteolytic environment and in the process degrades extracellular matrix and growth factors. And so now your dermis is uneven and rough. And then finally, LOX produces more non-soluble fibrin fragments, which advances the appearance um, of the skin and again, causes more disruption in the extracellular matrix. So with all of these proteins and enzymes, what happens? You see that instead of nice regulation here, you see mayhem. And so here, we already talked about how the advanced glycation products increases the stiffness of the extracellular matrix and reduces elasticity. What about with the production area here? Now you've got irregularity of the extracellular matrix composition and structure, more altered cell ECM interactions, and then you compromise the cellular function, whether it's proliferation, migration, or contraction. And then with these extracellular matrix enzymes, now you have increased degradation of the extracellular matrix and of the cross linkage, and it's compounded by lack of removal of the damaged ECM. So all of these together, now you can understand why in a hyperglycemic patient, in a diabetic patient, now you have lack of, um, you have lack of repair, you have prolonged information, um, even the nerve and blood vessel function becomes compromised, and then you're more vulnerable to chronic ulceration and hence the diabetic foot ulcer. So this is really what's going on um, at the cellular level and at the level of the extracellular matrix in the dermis. So clinically, now you have your patient in front of you. When should you suspect a diabetic foot infection? So in patients who lack peripheral neuropathy, okay, traditional signs of a diabetic foot infection are redness or erythema. The area is going to feel warm to touch. It's going to be swollen, it's going to be indurated, and they will have tenderness or pain to palpation or just sitting there even without palpation. And oftentimes you'll notice some purulent drainage. Be careful though, because in a patient with peripheral neuropathy, they're not necessarily going to have pain or tenderness. And in somebody who has limb ischemia, they're not necessarily going to have erythema, warmth, or induration. So then what do you see whether they, they have peripheral neuropathy or not? They're going to have some sort of secretions. Almost all of the diabetic foot infections I see, there's some sort of drainage from the wound, whether they have pain or tenderness or not, whether they have limb ischemia or not, you're going to see secretions. And when you look at the wound, something else that gives you a clue is that when you look at the granulation tissue, it's not going to be healthy and pink. It's going to be friable or discovered uh, or discolored, oftentimes with the grayish or darkish hue. And then the wound edges are not going to be nice and clean. They're going to be undermined. And you can notice a foul odor. So these are more clues that there's a diabetic foot infection going on. What else is associated with an increased likelihood of a diabetic foot infection? 
if you're looking at the wound and you do a, a gentle local debridement and you take your probe and it goes to the bone, that's osteomyelitis until proven otherwise. If the ulcer, if the patient comes in and says that they've had the ulcer for over 30 days, it's likely infected. If they come in and they've already had a history of recurrent diabet diabetic foot ulcers, that increases the likelihood of infection. If it's a traumatic foot wound by nature of the multiple pathogens that can invade the wound, that increases the likelihood. Any presence of peripheral artery disease, a prior history of lower extremity amputation, if they have a loss of protective sensation and renal insufficiency is actually linked with an increased likelihood of diabetic foot infection. So how do you evaluate the patient? Do you go right here and just look at the ulcer? No, you have to take a step back, look at the patient as a whole, and you need to determine are they sick or are they not sick first? because obviously that's going to help you triage whether you can treat them on an outpatient basis, or if you need to admit them to the hospital and give them a course of intravenous antibiotics. Then after you determine sick versus not sick, you have to look at the entire limb. You have to do a thorough exam of the entire limb. And then step three is actually looking at the ulcer more closely. So let's see what this looks like. I talked about the patient as a whole, right? So do they have any systemic signs of infection? So fever, chills, delirium, altered mental status. What are their vital signs? Are they tachycardic? Are they hypotensive? Um, so altered mental status, hypotension, tachypnea, tachycardia are all signs that the patient is septic and will need to be admitted. Laboratory abnormalities that support a diagnosis of sepsis, acidemia, acute kidney injury, leukocytosis. And we often, especially in patients with deeper, more uh, moderate to severe diabetic foot infections, we look at the ESR, the sedimentation rate, and a CRP or C-reactive protein. These are inflammatory markers where, especially with the deeper infection, these tend to be elevated. Now remember, if they're septic, they can be elevated too. So we're evaluating the patient as a whole, and now we're going to the affected limb. So let's say they have a, an ulcer on the great toe. So you're going to look at the entire leg, and you're going to look at, is there more proximal spread of infection? So look around the entire foot and up the leg. Is there contiguous skin that looks red and inflamed and is warm to touch and tender to touch? So do they have a surrounding cellulitis? Are there lymphatic channels that are involved? Is there regional lymphadenopathy? Do they have deformities that would put them at risk for ulcer and ultimately infection? Is there evidence of Charcot arthropathy? Do they have claw? or hammer toes, or hallux rigidus, as we discussed before? Are there bunions? Are there calluses? Remember, calluses, these ulcers almost always start as calluses and then develop into ulcers. What is the vascular supply? If it's on the foot, check the dorsalis pedis pulse um, and, and see if there's an absence of a pulse or if it's a nice strong pulse. And then also you can do something called an ankle brachial index, where you're taking the ratio of the systolic blood pressure in the ankle and then comparing it to the systolic blood pressure in the brachial artery. An ABI of 0.9 to 1.3 is normal. 0.6 to 0.89 indicates mild arterial obstruction. 0.4 to 0.59 is moderate obstruction and less than 0.4 is severe obstruction. Did they have evidence of neuropathy? You can do a simple bedside monofilament test to, to really assess whether they have evidence of peripheral neuropathy clinically. So now you've looked at the patient as a whole, you've looked at the limb, now it's time to look at the wound, very closely at the wound. And it is very important to debride away gently any necrotic material or a callus, and then gently probe to look for what? 
you want to see if there's a fluctuant lesion that has purulent material that indicates an abscess because an abscess is not going to improve or resolve with antibiotics alone. That has to be incised and drained. Is there a sinus tract that probes to the bone, which again indicates osteomyelitis? Is there a foreign body that needs to be uh, removed? What is the size and depth of the wound? Is there surrounding cellulitis? And if so, how much? And what are the quantity and quality of the secretions? Are they clear? Are they purulent? Are they, are they dark? Um, and then looking at the surrounding area of the wound, what is the extent and the nature of the discoloration? Is it grayish? Is it dark like an eschar? These are all things that are important to note when you're examining the wound. So how do you classify a diabetic foot infection once you've examined the patient? An uninfected, so there's a PDIS grade and then there's an IDSA grade. I go by the IDSA infection severity because I just think it's simpler. So a PDIS grade one correlates with an uninfected foot. So you have an ulcer, that's fine, but there are no signs or symptoms of infection. Now, for mild, moderate, or severe infection, what do you need at baseline to classify something as a diabetic foot infection? There needs to be local swelling or induration, erythema, local tenderness or pain, warmth, and oftentimes some form of a discharge. It can be purulent or it can be you know, thin, serosanguinous. You can see variations of opaque to white, but my point is that there's some form of drainage. So now that you know that it's infected, is it mild, moderate, or severe? So mild or PDIS grade two infection is local infection of just the skin and the subcutaneous tissue without involvement of the deeper layers. So there's no muscle, joint, fascial, or bone involvement, okay? And if they're surrounding erythema, it's less than two centimeters around the ulcer. And you also wanna make sure that there are no other non-infectious causes of what you're seeing. So there's no, it's not due to trauma, it's not due to gout, which, which can present the same way, fracture, thrombosis, venous stasis, Charcot uh, neuroosteoarthropathy. So this is classified as a mild diabetic foot infection. So what distinguishes mild from moderate diabetic foot infection? Now, you have all of the above. You have swelling, erythema. If you don't have neuropathy, you have pain, it's warm, and you have drainage. But now, you have either erythema extending more than two centimeters around the wound, or you have involvement of deeper structures. So now you've gone from just skin and subcutaneous tissue to bone in the form of osteomyelitis, joint septic arthritis, fasciitis, or abscess. And it's not severe because you don't have systemic inflammatory signs or symptoms. So this is a moderate diabetic foot infection. Severe, you have systemic signs of infection. Now, SERS criteria are outdated now, right? So these guidelines talk about SERS criteria, which were temperature, elevated temperature, elevated heart rate, elevated respiratory rate, elevated white count. Any more tachycardia, tachypnea, altered mental status, hypotension, are all signs of systemic illness. And so you have all of the above with infection present with systemic signs of illness. So this is how you distinguish mild from moderate from severe diabetic foot infection. So here are some pictures, right? So what do you see here? You see an ulcer. You really don't see a whole lot of surrounding erythema and there's no involvement of the deeper structure. So after gentle debridement, they tried to probe to bone, it didn't. So this right here is evidence of a mild diabetic foot infection. Um, and notably, this patient had drainage as well. 
So it had signs and symptoms of infection, less than two centimeters of erythema, and no involvement of deeper structures. Now, that's to be distinguished from this on the right, where you have a chronic plantar ulcer involving the third metatarsal head. It had purulent drainage, and they probed to bone. So this confirmed osteomyelitis. So this is mild diabetic foot infection. This is a moderate diabetic foot infection. And in either one of these, if you had systemic signs of illness, if they were septic, then that would be classified as a severe diabetic foot infection. When do we hospitalize? So of course, a septic patient needs to be hospitalized. By definition, anybody with a severe diabetic foot infection must be hospitalized, started on broad spectrum antibiotics. How about mild and moderate infections? It depends, okay? Certain patients with a moderate infection, remember, we said moderate infection is more than two centimeters of erythema around the wound or deeper involvement, bone, joint, fascia, abscess. So those patients, the ones to hospitalize that you should have a low threshold to hospitalize are those with severe peripheral artery disease. If you know they're not going to have a lot of home support, or you really don't think they're going to comply with outpatient treatment, have a low threshold to admit to the hospital those with moderate infection. And any patient, whether it's mild or moderate, if they, you've already started them on outpatient treatment and clearly they're failing, they need to be admitted to the hospital. So you put them on broad spectrum antibiotics, you get your podiatrist or orthopedic surgeon involved, and get a bone biopsy and you're able to streamline antibiotics, when do you release them? Well, when they're no longer septic, so they're clinically stable. If they've had appropriate surgery, any required surgery has been done. You've achieved good glycemic control. The patient and their family members feel comfortable managing the wound with wound care instructions at home. They're also comfortable with the antibiotic therapy and they have appropriate follow-up to see you within one to two weeks. You have to keep a close eye on them. Those are all the criteria to release the patient from the hospital. Now, for severe diabetic foot infection, all right, how do you manage those in the hospital? So remember, infection in a patient with systemic toxicity or metabolic instability, and hallmarks include fever, or signs and symptoms include fever, tachycardia, hypotension, altered mental status, GI symptoms, and then labs include leukocytosis, acidemia, acute kidney injury, and severe hyperglycemia. In those cases, you want to start broad spectrum intravenous antibiotic therapy. And what should that cover? You should cover upfront in anybody who's toxic, in anybody who's septic, MRSA, gram negative, and obligate anaerobic organisms. So we typically use vancomycin to cover for MRSA, piperacillin, tazobactam, so beta-lactam plus beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, which work together to cover gram-negative and anaerobic organisms, or vancomycin for MRSA coverage plus either imipenem or meropenem, which are two carbapenems that also cover gram-negatives and anaerobic organisms. Let's say a patient has anaphylaxis, known anaphylaxis to penicillin. Well, you'll still do vancomycin for MRSA treatment, but now you can add that to a fluoroquinolone or estrianem, which both get gram-negative organisms. And then your third drug will be metronidazole, which covers for anaerobes. So that's if a patient is penicillin allergic. What requires urgent surgical consultation. So necrotizing fasciitis, compartment syndrome, gas gangrene, or critical limb ischemia. In any of those, you need to get the surgeon involved up front and really consider, strongly consider amputation if there's extensive necrosis or life-threatening infection. You need Surgical consultation for abscess, as I said before, that is not going to improve or heal 
with antibiotics alone. You have to have somebody do an incision and drainage. Now, we sometimes are faced with patients who are in septic shock due to diabetic foot infections. And our surgeon will come by and say, we really think the patient will die on the table if we take them now, in which case the response should be, they can be stabilized, but there should not be more than a 48 hour delay from presentation to the OR time. Otherwise, you're increasing their risk of morbidity and mortality. And for a severe diabetic foot infection, remember these patients are hospitalized you start with the intravenous antibiotics that I talked about, and then can you switch to oral? You can, depending on the pathogens that grow and the bioavailability of your drugs, provided they have excellent bioavailability. You want to treat for two to four weeks, unless they have bone involvement, in which case it's six to four to six weeks. Now, I have in there IV antibiotics, there's a lot of gray here and there are a lot of nuances. That's not an absolute. A lot of this depends on the severity of the initial illness, the pathogens that grew, and how they're responding um, over their treatment course. But in general, yes, four to six weeks of antibiotics initially with IV antibiotics. Specimen collection, okay? Whether the patient is in the office or in the hospital, you want to get a good wound culture. Otherwise, you're treating by blindly. You don't want to commit all these patients to strong broad spectrum antibiotics if you don't have to. It's helpful to base your treatment decision on what grew from a good wound culture. So the first step, as I said, even for examining the wound is to cleanse and locally debride it before obtaining a specimen. And you want to use a sterile scalpel or a dermal curette or biopsy from the base of a debrided ulcer. And if there are any purulent secretions, aspirate those using a sterile needle or syringe and promptly send those specimens for aerobic, anaerobic culture and gram stain. Things to not do, never culture an uninfected lesion. It's tempting, isn't it? You have an open wound, and you're curious to see what's growing in it. If it's not infected, you don't need to treat it and therefore you do not need to culture it. There's no role for culturing an uninfected wound. You always want to cleanse and debride the wound to get a good specimen because otherwise you're just getting the superficial surface which tells, which tells you what? It tells you it's either colonized or a contaminant. It does not help guide decisions for therapy. And don't, for the same reasons, don't just do a superficial swab of the wound or superficial drainage. Again, you need a deep wound culture or a bone biopsy to guide treatment because superficial cultures either tell you about colonization or contaminants. The one exception to that rule is one pathogen that I trust from a superficial culture. And that one pathogen is Staphylococcus aureus. If I see Staphylococcus aureus, either methicillin susceptible or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, even if it's from a superficial wound, that one I will trust. That one, there's a reasonably high probability that correlates, that isolate correlates with what's going on much deeper in the wound. Everything else I don't trust. I want a deep, legitimate wound culture or bone biopsy. Let's talk about bone biopsy. And the way we do it here, we have our orthopedic surgeon or our foot doctors, our podiatrists come do the bone biopsy for us. So when is it most recommended? When we prefer definitive diagnosis to justify early surgery? Um, as opposed to prolonged antibiotic treatment. Um, if our initial cultures suggest high risk of osteomyelitis with multi-drug resistant organisms, we want that definitive deep bone biopsy culture. Um, if, there's, if they've already been on treatment and there's progressive bony deterioration or progressively elevated inflammatory markers like the sedimentation rate or the C-reactive protein, then 
you not only want to consider a bone biopsy, but you also want to talk to your surgeons about the possibility of resection or amputation. And the bone, the suspected bone, is a planned target for insertion of orthopedic hardware. This is where bone biopsy would be most highly recommended in lieu of a deep wound culture. How about imaging? So we've talked about, we're looking at the patient as a whole, we're looking at their limb, we're looking at the ulcer, we're debriding away the ulcer and getting a good sampling um, for, for biopsy and, and culture. What about imaging? You always want to start with the plain film. Why? You're looking for bone deformity, bone destruction on the plain films, and you also want to look for soft tissue gas in foreign bodies. Now, if the plain films don't show a diabetic foot infection, remember those are not the most sensitive test. An MRI is actually the most sensitive and the most specific if you want to pursue imaging to confirm a deeper infection like osteomyelitis. It's also helpful for things like soft tissue abscess, which won't readily light up on a plain film. Now, if an MRI is unavailable, the IDSA guidelines say you can use a combination of a bone scan and a tagged white blood cell scan as an alternative. I will tell you what we do here is we commonly go to a CAT scan, preferably with contrast if they have normal kidney function to look for osteomyelitis. And so, you know, this image on the left, this is a plain film, this one is on the right. Um, so the plain film, if you look at the arrows, you see prominent calcification of, sev of several of the digital arteries of the forefoot. And that alone should make you think of underlying diabetes. And then when you look at the image on the right, you see irregularity of the soft tissue in the digital aspect of the big toe. So this is a right big toe. And so adjacent to this, now you have the distal phalanx, which you saw on this image on the left. Now you see features of osteomyelitis, where you see loss of the cortex and underlying bone destruction. And so when you take a step back and you look at plain films, other features of osteomyelitis are not only loss of definition of the cortex and bone destruction, but you can also see soft tissue gas and you can also see a periosteal reaction, which is usually only visible in larger bones. And here on the MRI, you see osteomyelitis as well. Here you see the arrows pointing to soft tissue swelling and bone destruction. And so you see reduced marrow signal on T1 weighted imaging and then high signal on fluid sensitive sequences such as T2 weighted imaging. And if IV contrast is given, the marrow actually enhances. Now we're finally to treatment. So let's say that you have evaluated your patient, you've gotten the biopsy, you've made this diagnosis of diabetic foot infection, now what? Again, if you have a diabetic foot ulcer that is not infected, do not treat it with antibiotics. They just need local wound care to keep it from advancing or progressing to a diabetic foot infection. They do not need antibiotics. So just remember, not all diabetic foot ulcers require antibiotics, only the ones that are infected. So if it's a clinically, unin clinically infected wound, do you, you need, do you need to cover for MRSA? The answer is if they have risk factors. So what are the risk factors for MRSA? If they've had previous MRSA infection or colonization within the last year, you need to cover for MRSA. Also, if the local prevalence of MRSA is high enough. So what is local prevalence? The percentage of all Staph aureus isolates that are methicillin resistant. So it's, if it's 50% for a mild foot infection, lower threshold, 30% for moderate, then that warrants coverage for MRSA infection. And finally, if it's severe enough that failing to cover for MRSA while awaiting definitive discuss, definitive cultures poses unacceptable risk, then you wanna cover for it. So by definition, as we discussed, 
a severe diabetic foot infection requires MRSA therapy, like vancomycin. Although again, for an outpatient basis, so mild and some moderate, if they have these risk factors, you wanna cover with an oral antibiotic um, for MRSA. Now, what about gram-negative coverage? Really the, bigger, the biggest risk factor for gram-negative infection is having had antibiotics in the last month. If they've had antibiotics in the last month, you want to include coverage against gram-negative rods. But otherwise, in most of these infections, if they, don't, they, they haven't had antibiotics in the last month, most of the time, targeting gram-positive cocci is sufficient. Something else you need to consider is risk factors for pseudomonas infection. So that includes warmer climate coupled with frequent exposure of the foot to to the water, uh, to, to bodies of water, and high local prevalence of pseudomonas infection. If so, then you want to consider empiric anti-pseudomonal coverage. So let's, let's take a step back and review this. Remember, uninfected diabetic foot ulcer don't treat. Most mild infections you want to cover for aerobic gram-positive cocci, so staph and strep. And many moderate, many moderate diabetic foot infections, okay, again, you're likely going to be fine covering with aerobic gram-positive cocci. And for these sorts of infections, on the whole, you can use oral antibiotics with good bioavailability. With severe, as I said, it's automatically intravenous antibiotics coupled with gram-positives, including MRSA, gram negatives, and anaerobes. Let's look more closely at the specific agents. And the ones that I have in bold have been shown um, to be a, effective in clinical trials, including patients with diabetic foot infections. So like I said before, with mild diabetic foot infections, you're fine covering for gram-positive cocci, including Staphylococcus aureus, and strep species, notably group A streptococcus. So all of these antibiotics cover staph aureus, methicillin-susceptible staph aureus, and group A strep, dicloxacillin, which is a penicillinase-resistant penicillin, clindamycin, which notably also has coverage for MRSA, cephalexin, which is a first-generation cephalosporin, and amoxicillin clavulanate. Now, Let's say they have some of those risk factors for MRSA that we talked about. So a prior infection, colonization in the last year, or your local prevalence is high enough, then you want to add agents with MRSA coverage, notably doxycycline or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And I say add because neither one of these has good activity against group A streptococcus. So you want to add one of these to the original drug to broaden coverage for MRSA. So from the moderate to severe category, I'm going to talk about the different types of pathogens um, that we see. So this list of antibiotics covers everything from MSSA to Streptococcus to Enterobacteriaceae, Enterobacteriaceae to obligate anaerobes. So levofloxacin is a good one for gram negatives gram-negative organisms, although it's not reliable against Staph aureus. Cefoxetin is a cephalosporin that has some anaerobic activity. Ceftriaxone, a third-generation cephalosporin that has good coverage for Enterobacteriaceae. Ampicillin sulbactam and ertapenem are good broad agents, but notably they do not cover pseudomonas. So if you want anti-pseudomonal coverage, you'll have to pick something else or add something like an aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone like levaquin. Moxifloxacin is a fluoroquinolone that has some anaerobic coverage. We have tigecycline, and then we have other fluoroquinolones like levaquin or cipro, um, plus clindamycin for anaerobic coverage. And certainly if you consider um, or if you suspect an extended spectrum beta lactamase, imipenem psilostatin um, is another recommendation. Drugs with MRSA coverage, linazolid, oral or IV, and daptomycin and vancomycin. Daptomycin, you need to monitor their CPK because it's associated with rhabdomyolysis. 
anti-pseudomonal drug, there are several, but the one mentioned uh, with data in the IDSA guidelines is piperacillin tazobactam. And this has the added benefit of gram negative and anaerobic coverage. Now, if you're looking at more severe diabetic foot infections, you wanna cover for not only MRSA and enterobacteriaceae and pseudomonas, but also obligate anaerobes. So generally, we've already talked about this, but you wanna do vancomycin or DAPTA or linazolid, so MRS activity, plus either ceftaz, cefepime, piperacillin tazobactam, estrianam, or a carbapenem. Now, ceftaz and cefepime do not have anaerobic coverage. Uh, neither does estrianam. So in those cases, if you're using those, you want to add metronidazole for added anaerobic coverage. I wanna talk a little bit about oral bioavailability because there is this perception that every single diabetic foot infection must be treated with IV antibiotics. And that's really not the case if you have organisms that are susceptible to drugs with excellent bioavailability. Um, so you'll notice clindamycin has 90% oral bioavailability, doxycycline 90 to 100, minocycline not far behind, Linazolid has 100% bioavailability. Linazolid you have to be careful with because if you uh, use it for over two weeks, it can cause thrombocytopenia and there is an association with optic neuritis. Um, levofloxacin and moxifloxacin have higher bioavailability than their counterpart ciprofloxacin, also fluoroquinolone. And you'll notice that clotrimazole, the trimethoprim component, and metronidazole both have excellent bioavailability. So this is a chart from the IDSA guidelines that tells you the route setting and suggested dur duration. Now remember, duration, these are not absolutes. These are general guidelines. So mild diabetic foot infection, um, you could do topical, but in general, you can do oral antibiotic therapy as an outpatient for one to two weeks with close follow-up, can extend to four weeks if it's low to resolve. So now moderate, you're getting into a deeper infection, right? It's either an abscess or deeper involvement like bone, joint. You can do oral or you can do an initial course, one to two weeks of IV antibiotic therapy. And again, can you start this as an outpatient? Of course, but remember your higher risk patients like those with peripheral artery disease or those who just haven't been healing on the initial round of oral antibiotics, you can consider an inpatient stay. And now notice, unlike mild, which is one to two weeks, this is a little bit longer, one to three weeks. Severe infection, these patients are getting admitted to the hospital, started on broad spectrum antibiotics, you get the, the debridement culture or the bone biopsy culture and you transition um, to, to an IV agent and then switch to oral depending on how they do. Um, and this is a little bit longer, two to four weeks. If you have bone or joint involvement, okay? So let's say you have a patient who is admitted to the hospital for severe diabetic foot infection they're started on broad spectrum antibiotics, plain films and MRI confirm osteomyelitis, and the, they have evidence of severe destruction and it requires amputation. If they've had clean margins and no residual tissue, you can treat with antibiotics for no more than five days. If there's residual soft tissue infection, but not bone, then you can treat with just a couple of weeks of a combination of IV followed by oral antibiotics. If there's residual infected bone, you have to treat longer. And these patients, especially if it's a virulent pathogen, we commonly treat with four to six weeks of IV antibiotics, maybe a transition to PO at the four week mark. And sometimes the whole six weeks is IV antibiotics. If they've had no surgery, and they have residual bone that's infected, then you wanna do an initial four to six weeks of IV antibiotics, and they may need to be on an oral tail for up to two or three months. So surgery versus not surgery. 
when to consider a trial of non-surgical treatment. So if this is a patient who's been admitted, if they respond well to IV antibiotics and they're tolerating it, and the degree of bone destruction hasn't caused irreversible compromise to the mechanics of the foot and the patient doesn't wanna have surgery, yeah, you can try a course of antibiotics without surgery. Other factors are if they have high uh, comorbidities that confers a high risk for surgery and there's no contraindications to prolonged therapy, then yes, you can treat with antibiotics alone. Factors to consider for bone resection are if they're persistently septic with no other explanation. If you can't really deliver um, um, broad spectrum antibiotics or the patient is unable to tolerate appropriate antibiotic therapy, if there's progressive destruction or deterioration despite appropriate treatment, if the patient prefers to avoid broad spectrum long-term antibiotics, um, and if you want to achieve a manageable soft tissue wound or primary closure, or I mean, due to factors such as acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, you don't want to do long-term antibiotics. These are all factors to consider bone resection. Life-threatening infection. What are signs? So sepsis, rapid progression, gangrene, as you see here, or extensive necrosis. If you see crepitus on exam or gas on imaging, extensive ecchymosis or petechiae, hemorrhagic boli. Um, if you suddenly have evidence of new onset uh, wound anesthesia, pain out of proportion to clinical findings, which is suggestive of necrotizing fasciitis. If they have loss of neurologic function, critical limb ischemia, extensive tissue loss, extensive bony destruction, or they're just not responding um, to antibiotic therapy. These are all signs of possible limb-threatening infection that's imminent. Wound care. So remember, if you're, whether the patient is in your clinic or being discharged from the hospital and they're on antibiotics, you can't do antibiotics alone. You have to include wound care. So remember, up front, even for diagnostic purposes, you're removing the, the debris, eschar, and surrounding callus. And for that process, you want to use a sharp um, or surgical method. And you can use mechanical, autolytic, or even larval debridement of some wound. And you also want to fit them with the boot because you're trying to redistribute pressure off the wound to the entire weight-bearing surface of the foot. And this involves a cast or a boot. And this shows you a general shoe is only 20%, whereas the different types of boots really offload the pressure by a much higher per, uh, percentage. So dressings allow for moist wound healing and it also controls for excess drainage. And so you can start with continuously moistened, moistened saline gauze for dry or necrotic wounds. Hydrogels can also be good for dry and necrotic wounds, and they help facilitate autolysis. Um, for films, those are occlusive or semi-occlusive for moistening dry wounds. You can do alginate, which is pictured here, to dry exudative wounds. And then we have hydrocolloid dressings that help absorb exudate and facilitate autolysis. And you can use foam for exudative wounds too. So we have wound care consultants in the hospital and in the outpatient basis that we link the patient with to make sure they have the best wound care regimen possible to continue with their antibiotics. Remember, for uninfected wounds, you want to link them with, with wound care as well to keep them from becoming infected. These patients need to be followed very closely within two weeks of initiating treatment and then every few weeks. Work closely with your podiatrist or orthopedic surgeon if they were involved. I often see them with the surgeon so that we're looking at the same wound and coming up with the same plan. And you're trending inflammatory markers if there's a deep infection like bone infection. What I want to see in my patients with bone infection that I'm treating with four to six weeks of antibiotics is not only is the wound healing, but my ESR and CRP are trending down to normal. 
So downtrending to normalizing inflammatory markers, good healing of the wound tells me that I can stop antibiotic therapy. Prevention is key. I had alluded to this um, during the early part of my lecture. Prevention of diabetic foot ulcer and ultimately infection, you need to counsel the patients to not smoke. They should never walk barefoot. Your diabetic patients should always have socks and good shoes on. We also tell them to avoid hot decks and hot sand while barefoot. They should always have protective covering over their feet. Before they bathe, they should test the water temperature to make sure it's not too hot. Remember, neuropathic patients won't be able to tell if it's too hot, and that's when they develop burns, openings in their feet that are vulnerable to infection. Toenails need to be trimmed. Sharp edges need to be removed with the nail file. Cuticles should not be cut. When they do bathe, it should be in lukewarm water. And when they're out of the shower or the tub, they need to dry very well, including between the toes. And nightly, they need to be checking their feet for cracks or ulcers. Shoes should be good fitting shoes, not too tight, not too loose. Um, if the feet are deformed or have ulcers, the shoe should be custom made. Socks should fit well. And then of course, it goes without saying optimal control of diabetes and peripheral artery disease. So most of this came from the Infectious Disease Diseases Society of America. I would strongly encourage you to read diabetic foot infection guidelines from the IDSA. Lots of good information and graphics. And I wanna thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash. And thank you everyone for joining in. If anyone has questions, now would be a great time to go ahead and ask them. Hello. Hello. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Prakash, for really excellent talk. A really wonderful presentation, and we all enjoyed it very much. And this is so relevant in our context as we get to manage patients with diabetic foot infections nearly daily mm -hmm. alongside this. And I'm also personally really happy about your recommendations about uh, prevention. And that's something sometimes we forget. We get carried on managing these patients when they come in with ulcers and infections when we could have actually prevented that. So that was really detailed and that's going to be really helpful in our management of these patients. Now, I have a couple of questions. So the first thing I wanted to find out is like how sensitive or and specific actually is the probe to bone test? Like, when attempting to diagnose osteomyelitis, how much should we rely on that? Or should we just move on straight to get imaging to look at those bones for patients who present with diabetic foot infections? The second was about uh, deep tissue infections. Like occasionally, we, the patients come, we start treatment without getting a without getting a sample for culture or without getting a bone biopsy, for example. Now, when this happens, and maybe we are not satisfied with the evolution, at that point, we need tissue. Now, do you advise discontinuing the antibiotics in this case before getting the tissue or the bone biopsy? And if yes, for what duration? And the last question was about something I read in the literature that I found a little bit controversial. What about the use of granulocytes only poly stimulating factor in diabetic foot infection? Now, is that beneficial? Does that help at all with quick recovery from these infections? Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, so let me start with the first question with probe to bone. That is an excellent and reliable test. I would say it's very sensitive, very specific for bone infection. If you have somebody with signs and symptoms of a diabetic foot infection, so pain, drainage, um, tenderness to palpation, overlying discoloration, and it probes to bone, 
that is a bone infection. That is osteomyelitis. The role of imaging from there is to look at the extent of destruction of the bone. Further imaging will tell you where else in the surrounding area do you have destruction and is it salvageable? So I would say trust the probe to bone test. It's an excellent test. Now, you talked about with the second question, a lot of these patients, you start on antibiotics, they don't get better. And then do you want to go to a bone biopsy or a deep wound culture? I want to strongly, strongly encourage you to start with a deep wound culture or a bone biopsy first. That should be your habit. That should be the first step in treating these patients. Try not to, to treat blindly unless you absolutely have no choice. That is how important that initial culture is. Now, there are times when you don't have access to a deep wound culture or a bone biopsy, and you have no choice but to try and treat with the broad um, spectrum of agents that cover the likely pathogens. In those cases, if they're not getting better, yes, it is reasonable to pursue a deeper culture like a bone biopsy. What I would recommend in those cases is if it's a chronic wound and the patient is hemodynamically stable, so not septic and does not have surrounding cellulitis, hold the antibiotics for 48 hours and then get your deep culture. That way, it's not as influenced by antibiotics, and hopefully something will grow so that you can target um, you know, definitive treatment against the causative pathogens. Um, with granulocyte colony stimulating factor, it's not really mentioned as definitive practice in the guidelines. And in all of my years of practice, I've never used it. The times I have seen it is in febrile neutropenic patients. And even in those patients, it hastens neutrophil recovery, but doesn't even help with morbidity and, and mortality. And so its relevance in diabetic foot infections, I would say, is questionable. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I loved your comment about prevention. Absolutely. Um, I have had so many diabetic patients who... When I tell them, do you check your feet every night? Almost all of them say no. <laughs> and if they just check their feet every night, you would see little cracks, right? You would see little ulcers developing that they could immediately address with wound care to keep it from progressing to a point that it's, it's infected and now you have destruction of underlying tissue. So I completely agree with you. I think prevention is key. That seems to be all from our side. Thank you very much once again for your presentation. Thank you so much. Molly, I will turn it over to you. Thank you and the Health for the World team again so much. Thank you, Dr. Prakash, for joining and giving your wonderful talk. We really appreciate it on behalf of Health for the World. I do see one question in the chat. Uh, someone's asking, when can we use the and PWT. I don't understand NPWT. Can you elaborate? Negative pressure wound therapy. Yeah, so you're talking about hyperbaric therapy? Yeah, so it's interesting because the, the data, again, is not definitive for hyperbaric therapy. If you have, I would argue that if you have wounds that are slow to heal, um, I would make that decision with the surgeon um, and the wound specialist about whether hyperbaric therapy would be indicated. That's not a decision I make on my own as a clinician, I involve my wound experts, specifically the surgeons and the wound specialists. But please know the data on hyperbarics are not definitive. So I, I wouldn't say, yes, you should definitively use hyperbarics in these specific instances. It's on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's for those that are not healing with your traditional treatment, your traditional wound care and your antibiotics. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I don't see any more questions in the chat. And with our time coming to an end, I think we'll take this as a closing. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining and Dr. Prakash again for your wonderful talk. Hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.